It's a real pleasure tonight to welcome Dr. Nancy Knowlton, and she's going to discuss her Ocean Optimism Initiative. She's the Sant Chair for Marine Sciences at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C. She's an expert on coral reefs and ocean diversity. She also is the co-host of the Earth Optimism Summit in Washington, D.C. She got her bachelor's degree at Harvard, her PhD at Berkeley, and after getting her PhD, she had a NATO fellowship, and then after that, she became a professor at Yale University, and from there, she went to the Smithsonian Tropical Research Center in Panama, and was recruited from there to go to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where she created a program on marine biodiversity, the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation, and also held an endowed chair. She's a recipient of many honors, including election to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she serves as editor-in-chief of the Smithsonian's Ocean Portal, and also is the author of a best-selling book, Citizens of the Sea, which celebrated the end of the, uh, <clears throat> that, the wonderful 10-year uh, study on the census of marine life. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nancy Knowlton. Thanks, Jerry. It's really, it's really an honor to be here. I'm really happy to be talking to all of you. This has become really my passion, talking about successes in ocean conservation instead of talking about all the bad news. And I hope you'll uh, appreciate by the end of this talk that there actually is quite a lot of good news out there. We don't have to just talk about the world coming to an end. But I have to say that I didn't always, uh, th this is uh, kind of, it's been a journey for me. I didn't start off uh, wildly optimistic, and that's because of the history that I had, which I'll start here. So this is a picture of the reefs of Discovery Bay, Jamaica, which is where I did my graduate work, uh, as you can see, a long time ago. Uh, although I like to say that I was a grad student at the age of four, so I'm not really as old as that date implies. Um, and this is what the reefs looked like. They were, uh, the, the bottom was covered with living coral. As you can see here, all those branches, all those heads, everything, that was all live coral. So about 70% of the bottom was living coral. And at the time, we knew that these reefs weren't in perfect condition. And that's because of what's actually not in the picture, what's not in the picture, even though I didn't take it deliberate, deliberately for that reason, but it just came out that way, because that's the way the reefs were. What's not in the picture is much in the way of large fishes at all. A few, few things that eat plankton up in the upper uh, um, on the upper corner over there, uh, but they were only a couple of inches long. So there were essentially no fish, but lots and lots of live coral. And at the time, we recognized that there weren't fish. It was because, of course, Jamaica, even then, uh, was a very poor country, and people were s literally feeding their families from what they could take from the reef every day. And so there was a huge amount of overfishing just because of the poverty uh, in Jamaica. But although we were saddened by the absence of fish. We didn't really worry about it because we didn't think that there was any connection necessarily between the fish and the corals in the bottom. And that turned out to be a really bad assumption because within about 10 years of my first starting to work on the reefs of Jamaica, those, the reefs themselves vanished. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions at the end as to why that happened. But here you see a picture of what the reefs looked like by 1985. They were covered with seaweeds. And the, amount of living coral dropped from about 70% of the bottom, which is what I mentioned before, down to about 5%. So within the first 10 years of my beginning uh, to be a coral reef biologist, I saw the entire ecosystem that I'd been studying as a student essentially disappear before my eyes in a, in a blink, literal, literal blink of an eye. And it turns out, of course, that this isn't really unique to me or uh, people working in Discovery. This is what I would almost describe as the universal conservation narrative, particularly for people who, like me, who've been working in the natural world um, for decades, but even people, younger people, who have also seen changes occurring, because the changes keep occurring, and there are more and more and more changes. And so we wind up with this situation where we talk about how wonderful things used to be, and then we were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, if you will. That's me and my husband there on the 
over there, sort of being expelled from the beautiful reefs of Jamaica. And what the result of that experience was that we spent a lot of time, literally decades, my husband Jeremy Jackson and I, talking about all the bad things that had happened to coral reefs. And so I would go around and give talks with titles like uh, Coral Reefs, the Canary in the Environmental Coal Mine. And my husband, uh, who's even more blunt on the topic than I am, has a wonderful TED Talk if you're really into kind of the essence of doom and gloom called How We Wreck the Ocean. I, if it's, it's kind of a type species for doom and gloom if you really want to see the best possible example of it. And we did this literally for decades. And it got to the point, we were literally called Dr. Doom and Gloom on the lecture circuit. And an artist named Ian Bunn somehow found out about me. And he, in this, uh, on the slide, it says, as a quote that he found that I something I'd said in the course of a talk, it's bad and we know it's going to get, it's getting worse. And, and I was talking at the time about ocean acidification, so he took an image of my face and then essentially acidified it. He dissolved little bits and pieces away from it. So that's what you see on the left, why it looks so weird. Um, and, and, this, and we did this, as I said, literally for decades. But it got to the point where I started really wondering if this was the best way to go about talking about conservation. And in, and in many ways, it, that, that my questioning of the constant focus on essentially the, up here, the, the glass half empty part of the conversation, dead zones, extinction, acidification, overfishing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, plastic pollution, you name it. Um, I, I was teaching, as uh, Jerry mentioned, in this program that we created at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And it was a very interdisciplinary program. It involved bringing biologists, physical scientists, economists, anthropologists, all together to work on solving the ocean problems. And so, we st so because it was so interdisciplinary, it was important to start the course off with a kind of laying the, laying the groundwork so that these different people from different disciplines could actually understand what they were, what economists could talk to a biologist and vice versa. So we always began it with lectures on the state of the ocean. And you can imagine, given what I've just shown you, that those were not the most cheerful lectures. And I started thinking about uh, the program that we were running as a kind of medical school for the ocean. And yet, what we seem to be doing, uh, contrary to what's done in medical school, in medical school, you don't talk you don't train students to write obituaries for their patients, even though, of course, every patient winds up at some point with an obituary. But I felt like what we were doing was training our students to write ever more refined obituaries of nature. Uh, and, this, and this was not the right way of working if what we were trying to do is run medical school for the ocean. So I started thinking a lot about this other, the glass half full side of things, the protected areas, green energy, species recovery, cleaner waters, and, and a lot of different um, aspects of what was working in ocean conservation instead of only concentrating on the doom and gloom. And, and so I, and it turns out this, uh, this was a realization that came to me simply by working with students. But it's not a, I should have, if I'd really known something about the social science of, conserv of, of communication, um, I would have made this transition long before. Because it turns out that for decades, social scientists have known that if you present people with really big problems and no solutions, it doesn't lead to action. It leads to apathy. Because you know the bottom line is, if you can't do anything about a problem, you might as well just go to the bar or wherever else you go to make yourself feel better and ignore problems you can't fix. So this is a great cartoon from The New Yorker. This guy sitting on the couch with his phone saying, making a difference doesn't make a difference. And the really sad thing is that an awful lot of people today feel exactly like that. In fact. Children today, uh, social scientists have done studies of how children relate to the way we talk about the environment. There are many young children today who actually don't think the planet's even going to exist by the time they grow up. So there's this incredible feeling of doom and helplessness that pervades, pervades the conversation and people's impressions of the environment. And this, happen, this, this affects not only the general public, it actually affects I would say conservation scientists uh, themselves, and so not only so this is just not very productive way of of, of working uh, on the environment if all you focus on is the problems, and it's also it turns out that this 
negativity, not only does it disempower people, but it's very sticky. And other studies have shown that, for example, if you take a group, to, uh, uh, take two groups of people, and you talk to one group about a, an intervention, say a medical intervention, or it could be a conservation intervention, and you tell them that 60% of the patients, let's say it's medicine, improve, then that group will feel very positive about that intervention. If you take the other group and say, uh, talking about the same study and say for the intervention was such and such, but 40% of the patients didn't get better, then that group, not surprisingly, feels negatively about that intervention. And that's not too surprising. But what's really interesting is if you then go back to the positive group and you say 60% did well, but 40% actually didn't improve at all, then that initially positive group becomes much more negative in the way they think about the intervention. Uh, but if you go to the initially negative group and say, yes, 40% of the patients showed no improvement, but 60% of them got better, then the really interesting thing is that group still remains negative. In other words, if you start off with a negative, then it's sticky. And in fact, you probably have all experienced this in your daily lives. You might have to get some great news that puts you in a wonderful mood for a grand total of 15 minutes. But if something bad happens, you stew about it for hours or days or weeks. And I know plenty of people actually stew about things for their entire life, bad things that happen to them when they're teenagers. So this kind of stickiness of negativity is really destructive when it comes to, to working in the conservation field. So how to change the conversation? Well, we all know now that the best, one of the best ways to change the conversation is to use Twitter. And so I and some other people who had independently been converging on this importance of talking about things with a more positive framing, we got together as a small group and uh, had a workshop for a weekend. And then we thought, well, what can we do? You know, we've talked to each other. We've shared stories of what's working. What can we do to scale this up? And so we decided to start a Twitter campaign. And we voted on email, the people who had attended the workshop, about what the best hashtag would be. And we chose ocean optimism. And so the rest, as they say, is history. We did this in, for World Oceans Day in 2014. Three years later, uh, it's reached over 90 million Twitter accounts. And, uh, and this was without any kind of budget at all. And I think the success of this campaign is a reflection of the fact that people really are hungry for knowing what's working, not only just for knowing, but perhaps participating and helping uh, to make to scale up what's working as well. And so what I'd like to do now is show you some examples of the success stories that I and others have been pulling together as a result of this whole ocean optimism campaign. Because one of the things that's been clear as we've worked on this for year after year is that there are literally thousands and thousands of success stories out there. It's just that no one talks about them. And because no one talks about them, no one knows about them. So the, the first one I'll show you is, is actually a screenshot of, of something from Twitter. And so this is a study that was published, in fact, uh, just uh, within the last couple of months. And what the study showed was that uh, the majority of sea turtle populations are increasing in numbers. And that's because for several decades now, we've been taking really serious efforts to reduce bycatch, uh, protect the nesting adults, uh, protect the eggs. And in fact, sea, sea turtle numbers are increasing. Now, they're not back to the way they were two or 300 years ago, but they are on an up, most of the populations are in upward tra trajectory. And so you can see that this is this Twitter campaign. It says, um, from this person who I don't know, Kelly Martin, with all the doom and gloom in the marine science world, the success story is nice. Thanks, New York Times Science. Hashtag ocean optimism. And this is the story itself. Sea turtles appear to be bouncing back. Researchers analyzed all existing public data on nesting sites around the world and found a tale of cautionary optimism. And what's interesting about this Twitter campaign is not only does it make people feel good when they see a piece of news that seems more positive than negative. But it actually, it's turned out to be a really good way of finding out what's working. So I encourage all of you who use Twitter, if you want to find out what's working in ocean conservation, just go on Twitter and search for hashtag ocean optimism. And you'll be amazed the number of success stories that are posted every single day, usually between 10 and 20 stories every day. Now, not all of them are success stories, because when you launch a hashtag, of course, you don't control it. Sometimes people. 
uh, write things like, I got up in the morning, the sun was rising, the beach was beautiful, and I walked with my dog, and it made me, I just feel really great, uh, hashtag ocean optimism, which isn't exactly what we had in mind, but, but, but most of the posts are actually like this. They're about things that are actually working in conservation. So what I'd like to do now, this is about saving, the, under the theme of saving species, and what I'm going to do now is share about 15, 14 more of these success stories in five different categories. So a few of saving species, and then I'll move to some other kinds of successes that we're seeing. So here's another saving species, and I just learned as I was sitting next to Jerry that his daughter works on puffins, which I thought was great. How many of you have seen puffins? If they're really one, they're not on this, I don't think there are any puffins on this coast, but do you have them up north? Oh, Pacific puffins. Well, if you haven't seen a puffin, you should make an effort to try to see a puffin at some point in your life, because of these quintessentially cool, cute birds. They used to be super abundant on the coast of uh, northern New England, particularly in Maine. But because of hunting, they were basically eliminated. There was down, they were down to one nesting pair of puffins in uh, 1901. So a law was passed, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which prevented the hunting. But the strange thing was that even though the law was passed so that hunting didn't occur, puffins didn't come back to the coast of Maine. And there was a scientist named uh, Stephen Kress uh, who has worked on this project for his essentially his whole scientific life. He's written a wonderful book called The Puffin Project, if you want to find out more details about it. But he started thinking about why are the puffins not coming back to Maine? And he, and he started thinking about puffins as sort of like people. So if, if you imagine walking down the street and there are no other people around, and it's dark and it feels a little weird, and you get, you know, it makes you uncomfortable, and you think, well, this isn't really where I want to stay. I move off. The little puffins basically are the same way. They're also really social, like people are, and they don't. They they get nervous in in places where there aren't other puffins because they figure if there are no other puffins there, there has to be a reason there are no other puffins there. And so what Steve Crest did to counteract this and make the puffins feel comfortable was he put wooden puffins on the rocks. And he played puffin songs from the wooden puffins. And he brought some baby puffins to get the sort of jumpstart the process. The result is now that there are hundreds and hundreds of puffins nesting on the shores of Maine. And not only that, this method has been used over and over and over again with, because many, many seabirds are social the way puffins are. And so you can use this sort of social encouragement to actually get birds to come back in a variety of species, not just puffins. Now here's another story. And this one is about sharks. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, sharks have been decimated by overfishing uh, because, first of all, sharks don't produce a lot of babies. They're not like many uh, bony fishes who produce millions of eggs. They have m much slower reproductive uh, rate. They produce limited numbers of young every time they do it. And they're super valuable because of the high prestige associated with shark fin soup. And with the growth of the middle class in China and Chinese communities around the world, there are more and more banquets that are being held where people are serving shark fin soup. And the result has been, in some cases, shark populations crashing to about 5% of their original numbers. So it's a huge problem. Uh, it's also a really cruel practice because the fins are so valuable that what fisher, fishers tend to do is just slice the fins off the of the living sharks, throw the fins in the boat, and then just dump the shark, which is much less valuable, overboard. And so it, it uh, suffocates and bleeds to death um, uh, just for the fins. So this has generated a lot of the recognition that the practice was barbaric and the decimation of, sh of shark populations that has resulted has generated a lot of interest in a variety of different ways in the public and in governments and business. So. Uh, in one way, the, the barbaric nature of it has led to a number of social campaigns which discourage people from, uh, people from serving shark fin soup. And the example I like is, uh, which, which you can see up here, we are going to stop the soup one bowl at a time with a project that was started by a, a Canadian, um, um, Canadian Chinese woman who learned about what was going on and was so horrified by the role that Chinese culture was playing in the decimation of sharks that she started a program where she reached out to young, uh, soon-to-be-married couples and said, please sign a pledge that you won't serve shark fin soup uh, at, your, at your wedding banquet. And this, has, this kind of effort has, been, uh, has, has created a lowering of demand for shark fins in, in a number of parts of the world. 
Uh, but it's also true that sharks have just gotten really interesting to people. I mean, sharks, the, sort of the, the visibility of sharks was increased remarkably by the film Jaws. How many of you have seen, actually seen the film Jaws? So many, but not all of you. It was kind of a, it started the horror, summer horror film genre. It was made a, couple, a little bit over 40 years ago. And it's got people really anxious and fearful of sharks as a result. But people are now have a much more sort of friendly attitude about sharks. And you see that in a couple of things I've illustrated here. First of all, here's this uh, Twitter account, at Mary Lee Shark. I mean, obviously, the shark, she, this is a tag shark that cruises up and down the East Coast. And so you can see, follow her. And, uh, and she posts on Twitter. Of course, she doesn't really post, but it seems like she's posting. And so, so recently, um, she posted this really cool picture of a, caras a carousel where usually you have little ponies or some kind of mammal. And so here you've got one where the shark is a, is a, on a merry-go-round instead of a, a pony. And uh, she's, got, she's very popular. She's got 129,000 followers. Like, I have 6,000 followers. So give you, you know, it's not maybe a uh, hugely spectacularly uh, large number, but it's a pretty large number. It's a lot larger than almost all the scientists that I know. So this is, this is a reflection of the interests of people in sharks. And then here, of course, for those of you who remember the a couple of years ago, there was this shark dancing, uh, uh, not sure quite how to describe it, sort of shark dancing event associated with Carrie, Katy Perry at the Super Bowl. And the left shark became danced in a very peculiar way, for those of you who remember, and sort of took over Twitter world, and everyone was paying a lot more attention to the left shark than uh, Katy Perry, and so it was a uh, voted most valuable player at one point on uh, the internet. Uh, but in addition to the sort of just general interest, it turns out that sharks are really turn out to be worth quite a lot of money because people are interested in them, particularly in the context of tourism. And so in Palau, which has um, quite a few sharks swimming around and a big tourism industry that's based on divers and snorkelers, it was uh, estimated that the value of a shark in terms of its fins was only about $108. But the value of a live shark in terms of the tourism industry that it supported over the course of its rather long lifetime was almost $2 million. So you don't have to be much of an economist to know that $2 million is a lot, lot bigger than 108. And so as a result, the government in Palau banned shark finning uh, because the sharks are so much more useful to them as a source of income from tourism as they, than they are as a, as a fisheries. And you even have tourism. Uh, shark tourism in the United States, including, ironically, in the place where Jaws was filmed. So here's a headline from the New York Times, uh, which is about shark tourism in Cape Cod, exactly where the film Jaws was filmed. And so the title, uh, for those of you who have seen the, the film, uh, the, title, the headline of the piece was, they're going to need a bigger gift shop. If you haven't seen the film, you have to go see it to understand the joke. And then finally, um, this is all of these things, the revulsion, the economic value, the general interest has led to real changes at the top in terms of governments and hotels and airlines now all forbidding the selling of soup or the transporting of shark fins. Uh, and the consequence of all of this has been the plummeting of prices in places like Hong Kong, which are an epicenter of shark finning. So sharks are not out of the woods, but they're very, very promising developments on all sorts of fronts that make this shark conservation story a much more positive one now than it was, say, 10 years ago. OK, let's talk about now about protecting places instead of species, per se. This is a, a story about a place uh, not that far from here in uh, Cabo, uh, in uh, the bottom of Baja California, a place called Cabo Pulmo. This was a small fishing village, uh, almost essentially an extended family. And uh, it had suffered from many of the things that have, uh, that have uh, impacted local fishing, artisanal fishing communities, which was the overfish problem of overfishing. And so people were fishing harder and harder and harder for less and less and less fish. And so the head of the village, the sort of patrifamilias, um, got the village together and said, you know, we are on a road to ruin. If we just keep going this direction, There'll be nothing to eat, nothing to sell. No one will want to come and visit here because there's nothing to see underwater. And so they set up what was called the Cabo Pomo uh, National Park. And it has been a spectacular success. So here you see um, 
uh, a compare. This is Cabo Pomo National Park, and these are a series of comparisons between 1999 and 2009 when this study was done. And this is a, these are places where there are no regulations, the completely open fishing. And these are places that are technically parks but aren't protected, and so they really aren't parks at all. So you can see that there's no change in the number of, uh, a number of fish, which is what you see on this axis. But here's Cabo Pomo National Park, 1999, 2009, a huge, huge increase in the number of fish more than four tons of fish biomass per hectare. It's been described as the most successful marine protected area anywhere on the planet. And that's really remarkable when you think about the fact that this is a small artisanal fishing village. This was not a place that had a lot of money, a lot of resources. And if they can make a difference, really anybody can make a difference. And perhaps the most important part of this story, it's not just the fish. Now, it's great that there are lots of fish. But in addition, tourists have come back to Cabo Pomo because this is what it looks like underwater. So you can go online and see these spectacular pictures of what the underwater landscape is of Cabo Pomo. And, it's a, and the result is big increases not only in fish, but in incomes of the people that live in Cabo Pomo, $18,000 additional income per year for those that are in the tourism sector of the village. Okay, here's another example of protecting a place as it comes from um, I, from a place that I've actually visited because I spend about a, a month a year uh, in Hong Kong as a visiting uh, professor at the University of Hong Kong. And my host took me to this place, which is right at the border of Hong Kong and, and, uh, and mainland China. So it sits between Hong Kong and a, and a city called uh, Shenzhen. So Hong Kong has 7 million people. Shenzhen has 12 million people. But there are, so you can see this beautiful protected area underneath the shadow of all these skyscrapers and these huge population density. But this protected area is, it protects 60,000 uh, birds, including very rare black-faced spoonbills and all sorts of other uh, important uh, uh, wetland wildlife. And, and, and it's a big success, even though it's in a kind of improbable place. And then finally, I'd tell the story of John Weller, who's a photographer. He didn't actually start off photographing the ocean. But for one reason or another, he found out about Antarctica, and particularly the Ross Sea. And he became completely uh, concentrated and compelled by the story of the Ross Sea and the importance of protecting it. And he started a project called The Last Ocean. You can go online and find his, the film, The Last Ocean. And he does these amazing uh, still photographs. This is one of his photographs here. He also linked up with a scientist who knew the biology of the Ross Sea and a filmmaker. They put together a, a longer film, and then they devoted all of their time and energy to getting that film to people like John Kerry and the State Department and anyone else they could talk to to argue for the importance of setting aside the Ross Sea. And in 2016, the, uh, the Commission on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Life Resources adopted the Ross Sea as the largest, and it's the largest marine protected area, or it was at least the largest marine protected area in the world. So an amazing conservation success, which stemmed from the passion of this photographer for the beauty of the place. So I've talked a little bit about protecting species and places, but it's also important that we're not, marine scientists, most of them at least, aren't really arguing that we should stop harvesting everything from the ocean. We're not saying don't eat uh, anything from the ocean. The idea is basically to have your fish and eat them too. And so this is an example that from this part of the world, uh, a conservation success that had to do with changing the way fish were harvested near shore in near shore waters of Southern California. The problem was that you know, this is sort of the typical image of S Southern California, and yet this is where we've wound up. And how did how did that transition of you know this sort of concept of you know all this pollution and too many people turn into this big success story? What happened was that there, they, people used to put uh, gill nets in nearshore waters in Southern California. And it was great for catching fish, but the problem was it was catching a lot of fish that were coming inshore to breed. And so there was a collapse of all these fisheries of large fish as a result of the, the gill nets. And so in uh, 1994, they banned nearshore gill nets in uh, Southern California. The result has been this really big increase in the, the California commercial catch, and also a, a big increase in the, uh, the, the, the recreational fishery as well. And so this is a 
spectacular picture of the sky with this really big fish. And what's interesting about that picture is that typically when we've seen pictures like that, the person usually has this crazy mustache and weird pants, and it's obviously something from about the 19th century. And this is, you know, this is obviously not 19th century. This is somebody who's around probably still today. This is a big success by changing the way we harvest uh, from the ocean. Here's another example related to harvesting wisely and has to do with creating incentives so that people think about fishing not only today but tomorrow. And, they're, and these kinds of incentives work both in the small scale and the large scale. So on small scale fisheries, it's a really interesting example uh, from the coast of Chile, uh, which has a, has a resource that's quite val valuable. It's called the Chilean abalone. It's not actually an abalone, but that's what they call it. It's very, very valuable, much the same way abalone he is here in California. And these abalone, like the abalone here in California, were incredibly overfished. But thanks to uh, a, ser a series of collaborations between scientists and fishing communities up and down the coast of Chile, uh, fishing communities got together in collectives, and they decided to regulate the catch of the Chilean abalone. And they, the, the structure they use is something called TERFs, which stands for Territorial User Rights for Fishers. What it amounts to is that small aggregations of fishers get together, decide how many abalone they're going to catch. And you can see that these TERFs have now spread all up and down the coast of Chile. That's what all these little red uh, dots are. And here's the data for the abundance. So again, this is where you have no rules and regulations, almost no uh, abalone. Uh, this is density per, uh, per area. And these are the turfs, and these are the no-take marine protected areas. So what you can see is the density of the, the abalones are actually very, very well managed, even though it's compatible with a commercially important fishery. And then in a different, a different way of, of, of managing these uh, fisheries in a lot of developed countries has involved something called the uh, individual transferable quotas, or ITQs. This is an the, here you see a map of where ITQs have been established uh, as of 2008. And the interesting thing about that analysis was that they showed that in places which had these ITQs, it's sort of like taxi medallions. We don't even have taxi medallions anymore. Everyone uses Uber, but it used to be that there were taxi medallions, and uh, so people there was a limited number of uh, uh, these medallions which allowed you to run a taxi. So the same thing is basically with an individual transferable quota. The idea is you own the right to fish in a, a certain amount. And because you own that right, you think not only about how much fish you can catch today, but also you want to plan what you catch so that there'll be fish for you to catch tomorrow. And so here you see these ITQs, and the study showed that the probability of fisheries collapse when ITQs were in, pr were in place was reduced by 50%. So big improvement in the management of fishery, fisheries caused by this individual uh, transferable quotas. And then here's another example, one of many that has to do with reducing bycatch. One of the biggest problems with fisheries is bycatch, particularly of turtles and uh, seabirds and, and other organisms, which aren't the intended catch, but are caught as a, as a result of the, the gear that is used. And here you see one particular example, but there are lots and lots of these now as people start thinking really carefully, how can they reduce the attractiveness or the, uh, the propensity catch things you want to catch? So here's one using small LED lights, which is uh, used to, uh, which deters turtles and makes it much less likely that you'll catch turtles in these nets. But there are lots of different kinds of approaches that are used for seabirds as well. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit now about reducing pollution. Uh, and this is... Uh, an example which in some ways is so old that we've almost forgotten about how important it was, and that's the, the, the elimination of DDT. As I hope most of you know, DDT uh, was a uh, cause for a huge amount of environmental damage because it gets concentrated up the food chain, and particularly in birds, it causes eggshells to be, get very thin so that when the parents sit on their eggs to keep them warm, they crush the eggs and, and there are no baby birds as a result. And this was the topic of the book that really ignited uh, the environmental movement in the United States, namely Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. It was published in 1962. By 1972, the United States had banned DDT, despite the fact that Rachel Carson suffered from all sorts of death threats from the chemical industry. I mean, she was really under intense pressure as a result of her calling out 
DDT as the, as the culprit. But eventually, the United States took action. They banned DDT. And here you see uh, the, the, just one set of data for ospreys, which is, uh, shows an amazing recovery since the banning, which has occurred about here in, in osprey nests. Now, um, where I live in, uh, on the coast of Maine, ospreys are super common. In fact, they're so common that I suspect no one realizes that we almost lost ospreys completely. They almost went extinct. Bald eagles almost went extinct. Pelicans almost went extinct. They didn't go extinct because we took action. We banned DDT. And yet, the story is so old, we've almost forgotten that, that these birds are with us because of what we did. And it's really important to remember these successes and, and remember why they occurred. It's because we did something, and it made a difference. Here's another example about reducing pollution. This is an amazing guy. He's an, a, a lawyer in terms of his normal day job. But every weekend, he goes to his local beach in Mumbai uh, in India and organizes volunteers to pick up the garbage from the beach. And he's been so effective uh, that they've managed to have a transformative effect. Here you see it was written up by CNN. And uh, you can see here, this is what the beach used to look like. It was covered in plastic. This is what the beach looks like now. They've, uh, it's, not, it's considered the world's largest beach cleanup. They've picked up over 4,000 tons of garbage. And this, is, this happened because this guy basically said to himself, I can't just wait for the government to do something. What can I do? And I think that's really a key element of many of the stories that I'm sharing. With you. People thought, you know, what can I do personally that will make a difference? And he has made a huge difference. Here's another example. This is a California example of a company uh, called Burio. Uh, they make skateboards out of, and they make, they make skateboards out of uh, materials that are produced from discarded fishing nets from, Chile, from Chilean beaches. So they go to Chile, they pay people to bring them old fishing nets, they turn the old fishing nets into the materials, and they make the skateboards. And this kind of reusing of ocean plastic has now become very popular. There's a big program, actually, in the Philippines uh, where people are uh, paid to collect fishing nets and turn it in, and the, the company that takes them and turns it into carpet. And this is really a win-win, because you get rid of the fishing nets, which are either an eyesore on the beach or actually do a lot of what's called ghost fishing underwater, continuing to catch fish, even though no one's paying attention to the nets. And then, then these are communities that don't have a lot of financial resources. So they're being paid to have the benefit of not having the fishing uh, nets on their beaches or, or discarded underwater. So this is one example, but there are lots and lots of growing number of examples of pe people using ocean trash in uh, productive ways. And then here's another example uh, of uh, restoring uh, habitats, uh, or, or a new example of restoring habitats, so going from pollution to restoring habitats. Here you see planting of mangroves. Now, mangroves uh, have been cut down around the world because of shrimp farms. Uh, and this is really tragic because uh, the mangroves provide important habitat for baby fish. You really need mangroves. They also provide protection against storms uh, and tsunamis. So here you see how quickly proper mangrove restoration can work. Uh, so this is uh, an effort run by the Zoological Society of London in the Philippines. So here it is in 2007, here you have in 2008, 2010, and then 2012. So the, these trees get really big, actually, in a very, very short amount of time. And these efforts, sometimes uh, they have to be done properly. You have to get the hydrography of the water right. But when you get it right, you can actually have, make a huge difference. And these kinds of efforts are happening all sorts of places around the world. Here's another example of a rest, restoring habitat, this one from the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and it's a, an interesting example because it showed, again, how important the science was. Much like John, uh, Stephen Kress had to figure out how to get puffins back, wasn't you can't just throw oysters back in the water and expect them to turn into an oyster reef. Turns out you have to make big, big piles of them because otherwise they get smothered in the mud. And so that's what this work was done. It showed this big, uh, big increase in the rate at which the oyster beds grow, depending on whether you made them into a big pile, which is what you show here, versus a smaller pile. And this is what happens with, where there's no restoration at all. And so the result has been the, uh, going from essentially sandy bottoms with no oysters to really vibrant oyster reefs in a large part of the Chesapeake Bay. And it's a big success story. And it's not just in Chesapeake Bay. You're getting oysters coming back in New York Harbor and a variety of other places as well. 
And then this is an example of the restoration of seagrasses in Tampa Bay. And I show this example for a very specific reason. Well, first of all, it's a huge success. What happened was that in, in Tampa, as in many places, there was a lot of pollution. This resulted in lots of uh, plankton in the water, phytoplankton, small plant cells, plant cells, which reduced the clarity of the water, reduced the amount of light getting to the bottom. And the result is that all the seagrass on the bottom died. So the people in Tampa decided they weren't very happy with that outcome. Seagrasses are, again, like mangroves, important fisheries habitats. Uh, and they also, the whole, the whole situation was the water was kind of disgusting and smelly, and you couldn't see anything. And so they wanted to do something. So they passed some laws that made it possible for the water quality to be improved. The result was that in 2015, it was announced that seagrass beds had returned to 1950s levels. This is a huge success. But the reason I talk about it is because almost no one knows about it. And in fact, I've given talks at places like the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative meetings, which is Gulf of Tampa is in the Gulf of Mexico. And one year was actually the meeting took place in Tampa Bay. So I was giving a talk to 200 people people who study the Gulf of Mexico, the meeting was in Tampa. And I asked my audience, I said, so how many of you know about what has happened in Tampa and the amazing success story of restoring seagrasses in Tampa Bay? Four people raised their hand. So how can we possibly expect the public to, to think that we can do anything about the problems that the ocean face if we don't even know about the successes we've had as professionals? The public certainly isn't going to know. So this is, to me, a, not only a staggeringly important success, but also a, a very clear example of what a bad job we're doing in the conservation community with talking about what's working and getting people inspired to do more. And so I've, got, I've learned a couple of lessons from doing this. Has been, you know, I'm 68 years old, so I've been. This has been, a, as I said, a long journey for me. And, the first lesson I really learned from doing all this was it was quite important just to get outside your comfort zone. You see, this is a picture taken for a photo shoot of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at Vanity Fair. It was a green issue. This guy actually is the, um, the son of the person who created the carbon dioxide curve from Hawaii that you all see, all the rate, the constantly rising levels of CO2. Uh, that's his son who continues that work. And of course, I was just, you know, it was just a crazy time being on the beach. The photographer was a fashion photographer, and I didn't know what to do, so I just covered myself with seaweed, and the rest is history. But it's sort of emblematic of just sort of being willing to put yourself out there. And, and I think all this work I've been doing on social media, I mean, I didn't get any training as a graduate student to work on social media. There wasn't an internet when I was a graduate student. I mean, how could I? So it's really important, I think, for all of us when we're thinking about these problems and what we can do is to actually push yourself and, and do things that might not feel that comfortable uh, because you've never done them before. Uh, it's actually exhilarating to let go of the boundaries and do something completely different. Uh, the uh, second sort of lesson I've sort of learned in this trajectory is the important of, importance of reaching beyond the choir. So you guys, I have to say, you're mostly the choir in the sense of you believe in the ocean, you love the ocean, that's why you're here. But there, most people actually don't think about ocean conservation, they don't think about conservation at all. And it's really important to reach out to those people in a way that, that is relevant for them and their lives. And what I'm showing you here is a temporary exhibit that we had at the Smithsonian's um, National Museum of Natural History. It was called the Hyperbolic Crochet Coral Reef. And it was a, it was a piece of community art made by about 800 participants, about 4,000 pieces of individual crochet. The hyperbolic refers to the roughly nature of the crochet peaches, pieces, which is a kind of super crazy geometry, which I can talk to you about later. But, and this is actually the work of two twin sisters who are based here in Los Angeles, not Long Beach, but in Los Angeles, who run something called the Institute for Figuring. But what's really interesting about this project, which brought together science and conservation and community art. Part of the reef was colored like this, but the back part was either white showing coral bleaching or made out of plastic to symbolize pollution. Uh, the really interesting thing about it was the people it brought into the Natural History Museum who normally don't think about conservation or coral reefs or anything 
related to, to the ocean at all. So there were all these artists that came into the museum because they wanted to be part of this project. And perhaps the most striking thing was uh, sort of epitomized by a story that appeared in a magazine called Street Sense. This is the magazine, the weekly magazine, by and for homeless people in Washington, DC. So the work, that, the way this happened was we went to all sorts of different places to have, get people engaged in, in crocheting pieces for the reef. So that week that they ran a story on the hyperbolic crochet coral reef, the headline in Street Sense was, homeless women stitch their way into the Smithsonian. I have to say, it's the piece, I get a lot of press for various things that I do. It's the piece of press that I am most proud of and probably will always be most proud of because it symbolized what we were trying to do, which was get beyond the choir. And then um, finally, I think the thing that really, when you work on this enough is, even though, I mean, I love corals. I grew up studying corals. I just, I just love corals. I love coral reefs. But really, conservation is much more about people than it is about whales or corals or or other kinds of organisms. Or at least it's, if conservation is going to stick, if it's going to really work, it has to be about people and the natural environment. And I was really uh, fortunate to be invited to the Vatican to work on this project. Uh, it was a meeting called Sustainable Humanity, Sustainable Nature. Notice humanity and nature in the title, both. And Pope Francis, uh, a year later, used the results of the work that we did in creating uh, his uh, encyclical called Laudato Si. And it's, it's really clear from everything that transpired that the reason he really, really cares about climate change, which is what this was mostly about, and, and general environmental degradation, it's not just the environment that's degrading, it's the lives of people. This is a social justice issue, just as much as it is an environmental, you know, save the whales issue. And so that, this really has brought all these different pieces together and I, when I think about how to communicate about conservation. And so, what uh, ha this has led to now, as uh, Jerry alluded to, is the create sort of, yes, the ocean is 71% of the surface and 95% of the, the habitable real estate of the planet, but you know, we live on the, on the dry part of the planet. And, and there's a lot of success stories going on in the terrestrial world as well. And so, as Jerry mentioned in this, at the Smithsonian uh, in Earth Day weekend of, of, this, of 2017 this year, we hosted something called the Earth Optimism Summit. And what we did was bring together all sorts of different kinds of people to talk about what was working, why, and how to scale it up. And this was celebrated actually not just at the Smithsonian, but around the world. We even had the international, literally around the world, we had the International Space Station send us a greeting. And it was celebrated in Finland and Hong Kong and Panama and a variety of other places. Uh, and it was a spectacular success because I don't think anyone who went, attended had ever been in a meeting where everyone was talking about what's working. We were drowning in success stories. It was quite incredible. And so here are some of the pictures of the people that were involved. There were two and a half days, over 240 <coughs> stories. These are half the people because I got, ran out of time and space. So the, these are all the people whose names begin with uh, a through LA, but there's a whole other half of the people that I haven't even gotten on the slide yet. And the interesting thing about this people was it wasn't just the sort of the normal people. It was involved um, scientists and conservationists, but also CEOs of big business, small entrepreneurs, uh, journalists, venture capitalists, engineers, artists, politicians, musicians, you name it. Everyone coming together to talk about what's working, why, and how to scale it up. So what I'd like to do is uh, tell you three more stories about the sorts of things that were talked about at the Earth Optimism Summit to give you a sense of the scope of what's all the stuff that's happening around the world. So this is a story of a guy named David Auerbach, and he's the co-founder of this uh, company called Sanergy. And what his problem that he wanted to work on was sanitation in the slums of megacities in developing countries, which is a huge problem because these megacities involve enormous numbers of people, many of them who have absolutely no access to any kind of sewer lines. And in fact, sewer lines are simply never going to be a solution because they're just too expensive to lay out for this many people. And so what he realizes that he could take um, something like this disgusting bathroom facility here, build a beautiful, clean plastic one, franchise it to members of the little local community. Uh, one person would own it, and then that person would hire other people to clean it. So it provided not only clean, clean toilet facilities, private toilet facilities, 
uh, but also jobs in the communities. Then they pick up all the waste, they bring it to the outskirts, in, in this case Nairobi, which is where he's based. He takes the waste and he turns it into high quality organic fertilizer and he distributes it to the farms that surround Nairobi. It's an amazing win-win. It keeps all that pollution out of these waterways. These waterways all go into the ocean, so this is an ocean issue. Uh, and he provides jobs and health benefits as well. So that was one example. Here's an example of Kanari Webb. She's a medical doctor. She's married to a forest conservationist, uh, and she works in Indonesia. And she was horrified by the fact that many of the people in the village that she works in chopped down trees illegally because they felt they had no choice. They wanted to take their kids to a doctor. They had to chop down a tree. And so as a doctor, she went and talked to all the people in the village. She went on what she called a radical listening tour. She talked to everyone in the village. and She said, what do you need? What would stop you from cutting down trees illegally? And they told her two things, high quality, affordable health care and organic farming training so they could farm organically rather than chopping down trees. So she got Indonesian doctors. She sent them to Yale University Medical School where she'd gotten her degree. She had Yale faculty members and others come to Indonesia. Turned out in the neighboring island in Indonesia, there was a lot of organic farming, so she brought Indonesian organic farmers to the place where she was working. And this has been the result. So she's doubled the income. Now it's $1.50 a day. So that's not much. These, it gives you a sense of the utter destitution of these people. Lots more medical care, 18% decline in infant mortality, 49% decline in diarrhea, 41% uh, more children going to school. But look at this, 68% fewer logging households. They're now organic farmers instead of cutting down trees illegally. And this, in addition to these benefits, about 2,000 orangs saved in these forests. And of course, for the ocean, all that carbon dioxide pulled out of the atmosphere by those forests, which are an incredible carbon sink. And then finally, uh, the last story I want to tell you about is a guy uh, named Brandon Dennison. And he's the executive director of a company called Coalfield Development Corporation. He works in West Virginia. He was born in West Virginia. And he really cares about the people of West Virginia and the fact that they have been, uh, they're essentially losing their jobs, their whole way of life, because of the changing uh, economics of energy. Not really because of conservationists. Really, it's more because of fracking. But that's not necessarily the message that gets across in, in, uh, in West Virginia as to the reasons why their communities are in such poor shape. And so he uses education and job placement. And he puts these people that he's trained in jobs in sustainable agriculture, green construction, solar energy, and land uh, reclamation from, um, from coal mining disturbances of the land. So this is an. To me, this is really important. This is sort of the essence of getting beyond the choir. And I, I recently, about two months ago, there was an article that was published about um, how this is an easy problem to solve because there are more people working in Arby's than there are in the coal mines. And that story actually just drives me crazy. Because yes, it's true that there are more people working in Arby's than in coal mines. But it totally misses the point that those are real people. They have their kids to feed. They have their kids to educate. They have their kids they have to take to a doctor. And just simply saying they're not many of them and they're not important, when these are the people that powered the Industrial Revolution in the United States, is really, really bad. And so what I love about this story is not only is he creating, uh, solving problems with respect to climate change, but he's also creating a community of people who are doing better as well as doing what's right for the planet. So I'd like to close um, with these three quotes, because I think they're really important when we think about conservation. The first is a quote from Voltaire, originally in French, of course. But it is, don't, the quote is, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is so, so important. So often, it's you get people, myself included, we, we get a partial success, but it's not complete, or it's seems complete, but then something bad happens, and we get so depressed and so or so angry. It's really important to remember the successes and not insist that everything be perfect. Nothing is ever, ever, ever perfect. Conservation is always two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes it's one step forward, five steps back. You have to remember the steps forward in, the, in, in thinking about what you're doing and not let only the setbacks or only the 
incompleteness uh, weigh you down. The second is a quote from Bill Gates, which is, we always overestimate change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And you can't see this any better than in the energy sector right now. And I haven't told you any success stories in energy, but the, but the reality is that fossil fuel energy is now much more expensive than renewable energy in most places around the country. And the investment, for example, in 2016 was much more investment in new, fossil, in new renewable energy than in fossil fuels. And perhaps the, kind of the, the quintessential example uh, that illustrates this, captures what's happening, is that the Coal Museum in Kentucky, some of you may have known this, Coal Museum in Kentucky celebrates the coal industry. It gets its electricity from solar panels on its roof. Things are really changing so fast in the energy sector that people who work on this can't really even, the talk about business as usual scenarios for 2100 is a complete waste of time because we are no longer even now on a business as usual trajectory when it comes to renewable energy. And then the final thing, which, is, is, which I love and I think is sort of illustrated by so many of the stories that I've shared with you tonight is an African proverb, if you think you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito. Now, I lived in Southern California for a number of years. I know you guys don't have many mosquitoes, but I'm sure some of you have at least been bit by a mosquito more than once. And it's really important. The power of individuals to make a difference is enormous. And we just need to capture that power to make it happen. And so I'd like to share one last slide with you. And that is a picture of Martin Luther King. Because when people talk to me about how you know we've got so many problems, you know, you know, there's so many bad things happening in the ocean, ocean acidification, collapsing fisheries, all that. I mean, I could go on. I used to give lectures. That's all I talked about. And it's so counterproductive. And the way I think that to communicate this best is to think about what Martin Luther King and that incredibly iconic and important speech and, uh, to, to, uh, for civil rights uh, said. He didn't say, I have a problem, which is what we've been saying for way, way too long in conservation. He said, I have a dream. And all we need to do is focus on all these successes that are happening right now. There's no better way to envision that dream than to think about what's working now, why it's working, and how to scale it up. Thanks very much.